the propulsion cannot drive the two rudders together. You know, it, 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 it really... I, I, I'm just, it's my personal feeling, though I haven't seen it. And no, no, we don't have single rudder, single in a propeller with twin rudders. No. With twin rudders, I haven't seen it. That's why you said it's about in Holland you have yeah, seen in it. In Holland you have seen that in almost 80-90% uh, of the Indian rudders. On the houseboard, I believe. No, not houseboard. These are Indian barges. Yeah, I have seen, seen those barges yeah. flying in Rotterdam. Yeah. <laughs> and the, about the dam, you said, actually, in fact, it's not possible in our country to make the country like Holland. Yeah. The Holland is under sea level. Yeah. And we are above the sea level, we are going to be under sea level yeah, soon. Yeah, you are going to be under sea level. Soon, soon, yeah. but we can protect the country. Hey, we yeah, very interrupt again, please. Thank you very much. And uh, you can definitely, through email, you can ask questions. Yes, yes. Yes. Can we move to the next presentation, paper number 176? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Hope so. 12 minutes. <laughs> Okay. No. Since my time is really far, I'll just present this in a different way. <laughs> Let me tell you, not different from what's going on here, but the different approach to presentation of the paper. We have a regulation, and regulation has to be implemented. It's about ballast water. We take ballast water on board the ship, we treat it, we discharge it. It's going to happen in Bangladesh. The ship arrives in Bangladesh, and before discharging the ballast water, the port authority wants to know whether it complies with IMO's regulation or not. IMO has developed two guidelines, G8 and G2. G8 is to develop the system in a way that it's going to be harmless to the environment to discharge the ballast water. G2 tells the port authorities and the state control to how to sample the ballast water from the tanks to make sure it complies with the animals' regulations. G2. There's a big problem here, and I'm warning whoever is from Singapore Port Authority or whether you have connections over there. There's a huge problem with the enforceability of the G2 because G2 has scientific issues associated with G8. <coughs> this means your ships, the ships you are building, could go to a European port and get arrested. The captain can go to jail. Or the ships coming to your country can take a sample and let's say your ballast water does not comply with the regulation of IMO and then you can arrest the ship whilst the ship is not guilty and then you have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars on the ship. So this picture <coughs> explains what the problems are. And I go through it very quickly because I promise the chairman I'm going to do 12 minutes. I show the regulations. This is the part of the convention, so you can read it in my paper. This sampling is one part of it. This is the regulation. When you take a sample, there are two types of species in the water. One we call them zooplankton, the other one we call them phytoplankton. I don't think there's any marine biologists in here. Zooplankton are animals, phytoplankton are trees. Animals in the water are called zooplankton. Trees or plants in the water are called phytoplankton. Zooplankton are bigger. They should be less than 10 in one time to comply with the regulation. Phytoplankton are smaller and they should be 10 in, in every milliliter. So we can see there are two tens. So if a ship comes to Bangladesh, you take a sample. There are more than 10 zooplankton in one time. And there are more than 10 phytoplankton in one milliliter the ship is guilty, and you can arrest the ship. This is the research. This is how the G8, which is for the testing, is advising people to do. You can read about it. This is how systems get type approval. So when you design this system, the system is going to go through type approval with classification. This is in the paper. One of the elements with G2 is that when you take a sample from the water, it must be representative of the whole discharge. The word whole discharge is there. So you can't go in the tank and then take a sample and see your mint. Your sampling must be representative of the whole discharge of the ship. 10,000 tons, 5,000 tons, 50,000 tons. It must be representative of the whole sample. 
we have a set of environmental standards in, in the UK, and we have to follow those because this is an environmental issue. And they give us guidelines how to take a sample. And what is the meaning of the representative sample from the whole discharge? So if you are interested, you can read that. But they are also making some other issues associated with that sample. And I don't want to go into the details of that, it's a little bit scientific. But the whole issue with this is, when you want to take a sample, it is subject to a lot of variabilities. On board the ship, these are, this is the phytoplankton, this is the phytoplankton, this is the zooplankton, these are zooplankton, and these are zooplankton. So these are the ones who are larger organisms, these are the ones which are the smaller ones. You can also find a fish in your bar snacks. This is my own picture when I went on board the tanker in Dubai. Inside the ship, the structure of the ballast tanks are different, the type of the ships are different, the size of the tanks are different, and the pumping system is different. So these all add to uncertainty in taking samples from the tanks. Waters around the world are different. Different colors means the species in the water are different. The zooplankton found here are not found in here and vice versa. So every color represents another set of variabilities. So if a ship moves from the Middle East to <coughs> Singapore, or it goes from the Middle East to North America, it carries different species to different places. Now, currently, we have to come to a solution. What is the representative sampling? We make some assumptions. And in those assumptions, we said, every ton of ballast water is one population, and every ballast tank would the ship would have eight ballast tanks, which is not right, but we have less and more. But we have to start from somewhere. In my presentation, I have only one equation. This is the equation that the statisticians use. And uh, as Trevor agreed with me, there's an expression that says liars, damn liars, and statisticians. So statisticians are more than, worse than damn liars. So with the numbers, we can do whatever we want to do. But this, this is the most reliable equation which we can and again, representativeness. This is your ballast tank. I divide it into three sections, top, bottom, and the middle. And I divide it into eight tanks afterwards. And each one of them is divided into three sections because the species here, and the species there, and the species there are different. I can further cut them into more pieces than they make 27. But the longest story short, if you have three, if you want to discharge 3,000 tons, Sorry, if you want to discharge three tons, if you want to have representative samples, you have to sample three tons. If you want to discharge a thousand tons, if you want to have representative samples, you have to sample 905 tons to be 95% sure what you take a sample is representative. If you want to discharge 50,000 tons, you have to sample 8,000 tons of water. So just imagine, taking one ton of sample takes 25 minutes. So if you want to take 8,000 tons, the ship in your water is going to be there for probably for three and a half months until the sample is finished. So this is almost impossible. So that is the problem with IMO's regulation, that they are asking you to do something which is practically not possible, and it's statistically wrong. You arrest the ship, and you take five samples, and take it to the court, the ship can sue you and ask for demorage. And that is a heavy, hefty, hefty fine. So, do you want to stop the ship to take 8,000 samples? Probably not, because that's going to cost you a lot of money. This is the same uh, data in the diagram form. And then, I'm just referring to the maritime law, because we work with a few lawyers and talking about what are the implications, but then you can arrest the chief engineer, you can arrest the captain, I don't want to talk about it anymore. But this is an interesting test we did in Newcastle. I just want to show this and then I'll shut up. What we did, we, we found out three plastic tanks, extremely clean, nothing, no, no mud at the bottom and no uh, divisions between the tank. It's just extremely clean. We filled it up with extremely clean seawater. Then I inoculated this with the phytoplankton and I know exactly I put 10 per milliliter. This means this water is legal to be discharged. Then I let the valve open without any pump. Then I took samples every two minutes. Then I took samples every two minutes. Look at that. I have only 10 samples per milliliter. 
I took every two minutes I take a sample. You can see from second minute to 68 minutes in one hour tank was empty. The number of the species are collected from three tanks, tank A, tank B, tank C, because we have to repeat it, is always more than 10. Can you see the red line? Red line shows 10. So this means the ship is guilty, the ship is not guilty. The ship is guilty, the ship is not guilty. The ship is guilty. So you can see the randomness of the guilty. And this is an extremely clean tank, plastic tank, and everything is counted on board the ship, you never get this. They are also looking to other types of tests, as you can see that in most of the cases, if you take samples under extremely controlled conditions, you cannot conclude whether the ship is guilty or is not guilty, because there is no order between this one. If you take sample in 58 minutes, the ship is passed. If you take a sample in 64 minutes, the ship captain has to go to jail. And this is extremely controlled condition. So if the statistical results and the practical results show that there is a correlation.